I'm glad you could join us. Go ahead and stab the like button and stick around for the next untold story. Officer Jacob Martinez had been with the NYPD for over a decade, a career marked by routine patrols and the occasional adrenaline rush of more serious calls. But nothing in his training had prepared him for the series of events that began to unfold on a chilly October evening. It started as a typical shift. Jacob and his partner, Officer Linda Choi, were assigned to patrol a quiet residential area in Staten Island. The streets were lined with old Victorian homes, their aging facades casting long shadows under the streetlights. As Halloween was approaching, decorations adorned the front yards, giving the neighborhood a festive yet eerie appearance. The first call came in around 9 p.m. Dispatch reported a disturbance at a house on Mariner's Lane, a normally tranquil street. The caller had mentioned strange noises and possible trespassers in the backyard. Jacob and Linda responded, assuming it was probably kids pulling Halloween pranks. As they drove to the scene, Jacob felt an odd sense of unease. The streets were unusually quiet, and a dense fog had begun to roll in from the harbor, enveloping the neighborhood in a thick, oppressive blanket. When they arrived at the address, the house stood dark, the front porch light flickering intermittently. Jacob and Linda approached cautiously, their flashlights piercing the fog. As they reached the backyard, the beam of Jacob's flashlight fell on a bizarre sight. A circle of garden gnomes had been arranged around a large old oak tree. What made it unsettling wasn't just the arrangement, but the way the gnomes seemed to be facing outward, as if guarding the tree against intruders. There's something not right about this, Linda murmured, her voice barely above a whisper. Jacob nodded, feeling the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. He had seen his share of odd things on the job, but this felt different, almost otherworldly. They conducted a thorough search of the area, but found no sign of anyone present. Deciding there was nothing more they could do, they reported back to dispatch that the property was secure. But as they returned to their patrol car, the radio crackled to life with another call. This time, the disturbance was reported at a house just two blocks away. The caller was frantic, claiming to have seen figures outside, whispering and moving through the fog. With a growing sense of dread, Jacob and Linda responded, as they approached, they noticed that this house, too, had its garden gnomes arranged in a similar pattern. A chill ran down Jacob's spine. This can't be a coincidence, Linda said, her voice tense. They stepped out of the patrol car, and Jacob could hear faint whispers carried on the wind, voices that seemed to echo out of the fog. They drew their weapons, moving toward the source of the sounds with their hearts pounding in their chests. As they rounded the corner of the house, they came face to face with the source of the whispers. What they saw in the dim light of their flashlights made them freeze in terror, their professional composure crumbling. In front of them, shrouded in fog, were not trespassers, but figures, too tall and thin to be human, their elongated limbs bending unnaturally as they moved. Jacob felt a scream catch in his throat, and next to him, Linda stepped back, her eyes wide with fear. The figures stopped, their heads tilting curiously, as if puzzled by the officer's fear. The story of what happened next in the quiet neighborhood of Staten Island was far from over. As Jacob and Linda stood frozen, more whispers filled the air, coming from all around them, closing in. The fog seemed to grow denser, the night darker, and the feeling of dread deeper. The confrontation with these unearthly figures was just the beginning of a long, horrifying night that would test the limits of their sanity and courage. The figures in the fog remained motionless for a moment that stretched into eternity. Jacob and Linda, their training kicking in despite the terror clawing at their minds, readied themselves. Jacob's voice broke the silence, his command for the figures to identify themselves sharp and authoritative, even as it trembled slightly. The figures did not respond with words, but instead began to move again, their motions slow and deliberate, almost floating as they edged closer to the officers. The whispers grew louder, a cacophony of voices that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere, swirling around Jacob and Linda like the fog that enveloped them. Back to the car, Jacob hissed, the urgency in his voice pushing them into action. They retreated slowly, not turning their backs on the figures, until they reached their patrol car. Slamming the doors shut, Jacob started the engine, the vehicle's headlights cutting through the fog, illuminating the figures that now stood just a few feet away. 
the light seemed to reveal more details of their horrifying features. Their eyes were too large, black, and depthless, their skin a ghostly pale that seemed almost translucent. As the car's engine roared to life, the figures dispersed like smoke, dissolving into the fog. Jacob floored the accelerator, the car lurching forward as they sped away from the scene. Linda radioed for backup, her voice shaking as she tried to describe what they had encountered. But how do you explain seeing something that your mind insists cannot be real? As they drove, the fog seemed to chase them, rolling in waves that kept pace with the speeding car. The road ahead was barely visible, and the sense of being followed, of not escaping whatever they had just witnessed, clawed at their nerves. Suddenly, a figure appeared directly in front of the car. Jacob swerved to avoid it, losing control as the vehicle skidded on the wet road. With a terrifying crash, the car spun off the road, slamming into a tree. The airbags deployed, and everything went black. When Jacob regained consciousness, the night was silent. The fog had lifted, and the eerie voices were gone. Groaning, he checked on Linda, who was unconscious but alive. He reached for the radio to call for help, but static was all that answered. Struggling with his injuries, Jacob exited the car, the night air cold and sharp against his face. He needed to find help, but as he turned to look back at the road, his blood froze. The figures were there, lining the road, watching him silently. As he watched in horror, they began to move towards him, not rushing, but inevitable as the tide. Panic surged, and Jacob turned to run into the woods, his only thought to escape. But the woods were not empty. As he stumbled through the underbrush, the whispers returned, louder than ever, surrounding him, coming from the dark shapes that now emerged from between the trees. Jacob ran, but he knew it was futile. The last thing Jacob saw were the figures converging upon him, their black eyes void of emotion, their whispers melding into a single, terrifying voice. Then, darkness. The next morning, the wrecked patrol car was found, but of Jacob and Linda, there was no sign. The only evidence of their last moments was recorded on the car's dash cam, which showed only the fog and their final terrified voices. The mystery of their disappearance lingered, haunting the department and the community, a chilling reminder of the night when reality itself seemed to unravel in the fog on Mariner's Lane. Officer Mike Dalton had seen his share of strange calls during his years with the Albuquerque Police Department, but nothing had prepared him for what would transpire during the graveyard shift in the middle of a desolate November. It was the kind of night that chilled you to the bone, not just the drop in temperature as winter approached, but a creeping dread that settled deep in your chest, the kind that old-timers sometimes whispered about when they thought the rookies weren't listening. The night started ordinarily enough. Mike checked his gear, settled into his patrol car, and started his rounds, the dispatcher's voice crackling occasionally through the radio. The streets were unusually quiet, even for a weeknight, with only the occasional stray car or late-night walker. But as the night deepened, a dense fog began to roll in from the direction of the mountains, enveloping the city in a thick, opaque cloak that seemed to swallow the sparse streetlights whole. Around 2 a.m., a call came in, a disturbance reported at a local cemetery. It was probably just some teenagers messing around, Mike thought, a common enough occurrence. But as he drove towards the location, the dense fog forced him to slow to a crawl, the cemetery gates appearing suddenly through the gloom like something out of an old horror film. Mike parked his car at the entrance and proceeded on foot, his flashlight cutting a narrow beam through the fog. The air was still, the usual sounds of the city muffled and distant. As he walked among the gravestones, the beam of his flashlight fell upon fresh footprints in the damp earth, too large to belong to a teenager. Following the tracks, Mike felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. The prints led to a newer section of the cemetery, stopping abruptly at the base of a large, imposing mausoleum. The heavy iron door to the mausoleum was slightly ajar, which was odd. Those doors were usually locked to prevent vandalism. Mike pushed the door open slowly, the hinges groaning under the weight. Inside, the air was musty, filled with the scent of old flowers and damp stone. His flashlight flickered as he stepped inside, casting eerie shadows against the stone walls. That's when he heard it, a soft, scraping sound coming from deeper within the mausoleum. It was irregular, a drag, then a tap, drag, then a tap. It echoed off the walls, disorienting in the enclosed space. Mike called out, 
announcing himself as a police officer, and asked if anyone was there. The scraping sound stopped abruptly. Silence hung heavy in the air, thick and unyielding. Then, from the shadows, a low, gravelly voice responded, its tone mocking, Oh, officer, I've been waiting for you. The flashlight beam trembled in Mike's hand as he strained to see into the recesses of the mausoleum. There, in the flickering light, he caught a glimpse of something moving, a figure, shrouded in darkness, too misshapen to be human, its movements jerky and unnatural. Mike stepped back, his mind racing. His instinct was to flee, to get out of the confined space and call for backup, but his duty anchored him in place. He needed to know what was lurking in the shadows to protect and serve to keep whatever this was from harming anyone else. The figure moved forward, emerging into the dim light. Its features were obscured, but its eyes, oh, its eyes, they glowed with a sickly yellow light, piercing the darkness, fixating on Mike with an intensity that rooted him to the spot. The story of Officer Mike Dalton and the mysterious figure in the cemetery was far from over. As he stood face to face with the unknown, the boundaries of his world were redrawn, enveloped by the fog and something far more terrifying lurking within it. Mike's breath hung visibly in the air, each exhale a misty plume in the cold mausoleum. The figure moved closer, its movements unnatural, as if it weren't fully accustomed to its form. Mike's training kicked in, and he reached for the radio at his belt, his other hand instinctively resting on the holster of his gun. Dispatch, this is Officer Dalton. I need backup at... His voice cut off as the figure lunged forward, faster than seemed possible, its form blurring in the dim light. Mike stumbled backward, tripping over a slight rise in the stone floor. As he fell, his flashlight clattered away, spinning wildly and casting chaotic shadows around the walls before going out. In the darkness, Mike could hear the scraping sound again, now accompanied by a guttural breathing that filled the space with dread. He scrambled to his feet, heart racing, and groped in the dark for his flashlight. His fingers brushed against the cold metal, and he seized it, flicking it on with a trembling hand. The beam of light revealed the figure now standing mere feet away, its face coming into horrific clarity. It was not human, nor did it seem entirely solid, its edges seeming to wisp into smoke and shadow. The eyes that fixed on him were deep pools of malice, and a mouth, too wide and filled with two sharp teeth, twisted into a grotesque smile. I see you, officer! The creature hissed, its voice a chilling scrape against the stillness. Do you see me? Mike's throat was tight with fear, but he managed to nod, unable to tear his gaze away from those hypnotic eyes. What are you? Mike's voice was barely a whisper. A forgotten one, it replied, its tone mocking. Forgotten by time, but not by death. I dwell in the places between, and tonight, you've opened the door. Mike's mind raced. He needed a plan, but every instinct screamed that there was no fighting this thing. It was otherworldly, powerful. His only hope was to escape and seal it back somehow. What do you want? He managed to ask. To be remembered, it said, taking another step forward. And you will help me, won't you, officer? Before Mike could respond, the creature lunged. He tried to dodge to raise his weapon, but it was too fast. It crashed into him with the force of a gale, knocking the wind out of him. They tumbled to the ground, Mike struggling beneath the weight of an impossibly strong body. As he looked into the creature's face, he saw his doom reflected in its eyes. The last thing Mike heard was the sound of his own screams echoing off the stone walls, followed by the creature's laughter as it faded into the darkness. When backup finally arrived, led by the frantic calls from dispatch trying to reach Officer Dalton, they found the mausoleum empty but for Mike's flashlight, still turned on, casting light on nothing but the old stone floor. Officer Mike Dalton was never seen again. His disappearance remained an unsolved case, haunting the department and the community. The mausoleum was sealed, deemed a hazardous structure, but whispers of the Forgotten One, and the night Officer Dalton vanished, lingered. A chilling reminder of the thin veil between our world and the darker places beyond. Officer Harold Jennings had patrolled the streets of his small Midwestern town for nearly 20 years. Over that time, he'd come to know just about every corner and crevice of the community. It was a quiet place where news traveled fast and serious crime was a rarity. However, everything changed one late autumn evening 
shaking Harold's understanding of his town and its people. The incident began with a call over the radio about a disturbance at a local farmhouse on the outskirts of town. The dispatcher's voice was unusually tense as she relayed that neighbors had reported hearing screams and seeing strange lights around the old Harper property, which had been abandoned for nearly a decade after the family abruptly moved away under mysterious circumstances. As Harold drove towards the location, the sun was setting, casting long shadows across the fields. The Harper property was known locally for its eerie presence, a sprawling structure shadowed by large, gnarled trees, its windows boarded up and the grounds overgrown with weeds. The community often whispered about the place, some believing it was cursed due to the family's sudden and unexplained departure. Arriving at the scene, Harold's headlights cut through the dusk, illuminating the dilapidated front porch and the unkempt lawn strewn with debris. He called for backup, his voice echoing slightly in the quiet evening air, then stepped out of his cruiser. The air was crisp, the rustling of the cornfields nearby, the only sound breaking the silence. With his flashlight in hand, Harold approached the house. The front door was ajar, which was unusual since the property had been secured by the bank years earlier. Pushing the door open with the butt of his flashlight, Harold stepped inside. The air was musty, filled with the scent of decay and neglect. His flashlight beam flicked across peeling wallpaper and broken furniture, the remnants of the Harper family's hasty departure. As he moved deeper into the house, Harold noticed something odd. Despite the thick layer of dust on everything, there were fresh footprints in the dust on the floor, leading towards the back of the house. He followed cautiously, every creak of the floorboards making him tense. The footprints led to the basement door, which was secured with a new padlock, one that definitely hadn't been there during the last safety check on the property a few months ago. Harold's unease grew. He radioed again for his backup, urging them to hurry. Just then, a scream pierced the silence, coming from the basement. It was a sound full of terror and pain, and it spurred Harold into action. He broke the padlock with his flashlight and flung the door open, the darkness of the basement yawning wide before him. As he descended the stairs, the screams continued, desperate and chilling. Reaching the bottom, his flashlight revealed a horrifying scene. Several figures were standing in the dim light, their backs to him, surrounding something, or someone, on the floor. Harold announced himself as a police officer, his voice firm despite the pounding of his heart. The figures turned slowly, and Harold's flashlight illuminated their faces, pale and twisted in expressions of frenzy. The scene before him was chaotic, a ritualistic tableau that his mind struggled to make sense of. The story was far from over. As Harold stood at the threshold of the basement, trying to comprehend the nightmare unfolding before him, the figures began to move towards him, their intentions unclear but their advance menacing. Harold had to make a decision quickly, his duty as an officer now tangled in a horror that defied all his years of experience. As the figures advanced towards Harold, their features became more discernible in the dim light. Their eyes were wild, their faces contorted in expressions that were at once ecstatic and tormented. Harold could now see the person on the floor, a young man, bound and clearly in distress, his eyes wide with fear. Harold's instincts kicked in. He couldn't let this situation escalate further. Stop where you are, Harold commanded, his voice echoing off the concrete walls. He drew his service weapon, the severity of the situation demanding a show of force. The figures paused momentarily, their gazes fixated on Harold, and for a fleeting moment, there was silence, a tense, hanging silence that seemed as if it could shatter at any touch. In that silence, Harold heard it, a low, humming sound, barely perceptible at first, growing steadily louder, as if emanating from the very walls of the basement. The figures began to sway slightly, their humming joining the noise, creating a dissonant chorus that filled the room. Harold felt a chill run down his spine, the sound vibrating through his core, unsettling and unexplainable. Let the young man go, Harold tried again, his weapon still trained on the group. This doesn't have to get worse. Let him go, and we can sort this out peacefully. But the group seemed not to hear him, or if they did, they chose to ignore his commands. Instead, they slowly circled the young man, their chanting growing louder, more fervent. Harold realized with horror that the situation was spiraling beyond his control, beyond the realms of his training. This was no ordinary disturbance. This was something darker, something he could barely begin to comprehend. 
Backup was still minutes away, too far to help in the immediate urgency of the moment. Harold knew he had to act. He moved closer, trying to position himself between the group and their apparent victim, ready to use force if necessary. As he stepped forward, the floor beneath him gave a sudden, ominous crack. Before Harold could react, the floor collapsed, sending him plummeting into darkness. He landed hard on a lower level of the basement he hadn't known existed, the air knocked from his lungs, his weapon skittering away into the darkness. As he struggled to catch his breath, the sound of the chanting filled the space around him, echoing off unseen walls. Struggling to his feet, Harold felt a sense of dread wash over him. The basement level he had fallen into was darker, the air thicker. The faint light from above did little to penetrate the gloom, and as his eyes adjusted, he realized he was not alone. Figures moved in the shadows, their forms indistinct, whispering in a language he couldn't understand. The chanting from above grew louder, a crescendo of voices that seemed to shake the very foundation of the house. Harold stumbled in the darkness, searching for his gun, his only source of protection. As he moved, the figures in the shadows drew closer, their whispers becoming clearer, though not in any language Harold knew. Suddenly, the entire structure shook violently, dust and debris falling from above. A terrible realization dawned on Harold. The ritual, whatever its purpose, was reaching its climax, and he was trapped, possibly not just physically, but in something far beyond his understanding. In the last moments of the story, as the shadows closed in, Harold's thoughts turned to his family, his town, and the world above, blissfully unaware of the darkness that churned beneath its surface. His last breath was a silent plea for forgiveness for his failure to stop what had been unleashed. The darkness consumed everything, the house, the basement, and Harold, sealing them away from the world as if they had never existed at all. Thank you for listening. Now watch this video, 